And uh, one of my first jobs, I wanted to be a a, 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 a filmmaker, television film producer. And one of my first jobs was as, as a, an associate producer uh, on a one-hour network special <laughs> with a man named Robert Rieger. And Robert Rieger had then had made, really made a name for himself in the United States, mostly in sports. He was like CBS Sports was really Robert Rieger. And he asked me one day, he said, you know, he says, what do you know of Meher Baba? I said, I've never heard of Meher Baba. I said, he sounds like he might be some Indian guru or something. But I'm really not interested in that. I put away kind of... My religion days are over. I'm really not interested in hearing about him. And he insisted on telling me a little about his son. He said, my son was a, you know, my son was, we had given him up for lost. He was a drug addict. He was in and out of hospitals. And uh, he was a total mess. And we didn't know what to do. And suddenly he found this Meher Baba and it totally changed his life. And he was making some sorts of claims about Meher Baba, which really didn't... Uh, I didn't understand and I really wasn't that interested. But that was the first time I had heard Baba's name. About a year after that, I came into contact with this group headed by a man named Oscar Ichazo, a Bolivian teaching teacher, who had been exposed to all sorts of different spiritual traditions and uh, formed a school which was dedicated to the raising of consciousness in a way which I had only dreamed about in the priesthood, but which I had never had actual techniques for doing. And in my first contact with him, he allowed, uh, he allowed us to ask many questions. And one of the, many of the questions revolved around different spiritual personalities and gurus and things, and he had very little good to say about them. And then somebody said, what about Meher Baba? And he said, Meher Baba is the avatar of the age. And I'd never heard the word avatar. It didn't mean too much to me. Had he said the Christ, it would have really shocked me. But he used a word that I wasn't familiar with. But there was something about the way he said it and the respect I have for this man, even to this day, uh, in which a seed was planted. At least, I would not close my ears to that name again if I heard it. I would find out more about it. And he told a story that in 1969, he went to the desert in Arica, Chile, which is the driest desert in the Western Hemisphere to do a ceremony of dedication of his life to the work of this school that he felt he had to start to pass this work to humanity. It's basically a work of ego reduction. And he said that in that desert experience he had a vision of Meher Baba in which a figure came to him from a very long distance, was approaching him, and he said, I... I never experienced such love in all my life. And I think he used the word or the expression, and he dove into my heart. Well, I didn't hear Baba's name again until maybe a year or two later I was in London teaching for this school. And our school was in a section of London that was very close to the Mehababa house in Eccleston Square. And Peter Townsend was very interested in our school and had been over a couple of times and was interested in doing some trainings with us. Though he never did, uh, he did invite us once over to the Eccleston Square house to hear Ivy Deuce, who was going to be in town. There's somebody who had been with Baba and we figured, well, we nothing to lose, let's go over and see what that's all about. So we went to Eccleston Square and I walked in the house and the first thing I saw was this picture of Baba. And I said, I don't know who he is, but I have to have a copy of that picture because I felt immediately an art 
Was it Peter Townsend's house? No, it was the Eccleston Square house, the Baba house. Mm -hmm. And uh, I heard Ivy's talk and I felt she was very, very pious. She reminded me a lot of my Italian grandmother. <laughs> uh, the way she dressed and everything, it seemed like she had crystallized in the 40s. And the work I was doing in Eureka was quite different from what I was hearing here. I mean, it was, it was very nice what I was hearing, but the work I was doing in Eureka was uh, much more of a sword type work than a heart work in reducing the ego. Anyway, shortly after that, I came into contact with God Speaks, and with all my degrees in theology, and I have five of them, I couldn't understand what was going on. <laughs> but I felt there was something there. And uh, I felt maybe later in my life I would appreciate it more. Then I returned to the States, and after about a year, went through a very difficult emotional period. And uh, sort of a mini dark night, let's put it. And happened to be in a bookstore one day and came across Alan Cohen's book, Mastery of Consciousness. So I picked it up and I glanced through it and there were things in it that really attracted me. So I said, all right, I'll read this book. So I took this book home, and I can remember those days were days of really intense suffering. It was continual, all my waking hours. But moments of reading this book, I felt totally lifted out of all that, that pain. And that pain seemed totally illusory in those moments. And I began to feel really who Baba was. And I began, probably because I had followed Jesus in my earlier life very deeply, I began to really smell him and made him follow. And so gradually I started to tell people in the school about my Bala. And uh, there was sort of a wave of, of uh, attraction to Mayor Baba in the Eureka school at that time. And we had a one of the offices of our school had an office directly across the hall from the Mayor Baba Center in New York City. So I resolved one afternoon, I felt so strongly about it, I was going to go there. So I called on the telephone first and there was no answer. I said, I'll go anyway. So I went over there and there was a sign on the door saying, open on Friday nights, movies or something like that. And I was really disappointed. But I put my hand to the door and it was open. It was supposed to be locked, but it wasn't. So that was like the two or three hours I just spent inside that room. It was like having my first dasha in front. And to see his sadra and his sandals and uh, and uh, things that, a piece of rock from the tomb, from the floor of the tomb, these things touched me very much, although they were very superficial to me. <laughs> Is that the room where they would be having meetings? That's the room where they had meetings, yes. And his picture was everywhere. And I, and since I was the only one there, I felt free to go through every drawer and every cabinet that was there. <laughs> I went through and made a complete inventory of everything that was in that room. Oh, I made it a special lineup, didn't it? <laughs> well, it's like he turned the key then. <laughs> you could have well, walked off the You know, I felt that. I said, oh, these are treasures. He sunk all these pieces of his hair here. And what a tremendous temptation there was to take just a little bit of something. <laughs> But then I said, you know, how could I do that? He's here looking at me. <laughs> and so I guess I <clears throat> I started collecting pictures of Bobby. I you see I'm one that's very attracted <laughs> to form. I have my heart in my eyes, so uh, and I'm a carpet maker, so I started making carpets of Bobby. I made four or five carpets, about the size of this painting here. You made the picture of Baba? Yes, uh, I haven't shown them to you. I have slides, I showed them to you. Oh, Beautiful. Right. And uh, I would go to Baba meetings occasionally, but uh, I wasn't really attracted much to Baba meetings. I like the movies. The movies are uh, really attractive. And, uh, 
And then one day I went, it's supposed to be a movie. Thank you. <laughs> and Minu Karas arrived unexpectedly. And there was a story in Ivy's book that touched me more than anything I had ever read about Minu Karas. And it was the story about, it was in one phase of Baba's life where he was like a football. He was kicked away from Minu and told not to look at him, not to visit him, and that if he ever met him on the street, he was to turn his head and to walk the other way. And evidently Minu, uh, this touched Minu very deeply. And, well, as the story goes, I'm not sure that I have it right or not. He was in a city doing some kind of police work and... Uh, and it so happened that Baba was to pass through that city for a day or so, and he really felt the binding of the injunction that he wasn't to visit him or see him. I, th I don't think he had seen him maybe for five years. And uh, he was staying in the Hotel Royal or the Hotel Ruba, I'm not sure which it was. And he went to the station when Baba arrived, and as soon as he saw the party get off, he couldn't stay because he knew the injun injunction was not to even look at Baba. So he turned and uh, went away, went back to the hotel, and evidently went to the hotel and cried all night. And uh, Baba stayed at a hotel, and all night long kept bob bothering the mandalas, saying, We know, we know, we know. Go out and find Minu. So the next morning, they said, how are we going to find Minu in this big city? They said, he said, find him. So they went out and looking here and there, and it was totally hopeless. They didn't know where he was. And then somebody, I don't know who it was, decided to check some of the hotel registers and walked into this hotel right around the corner from Baba's hotel. Baba was at the Regal, and... This was the Royal or something. There were hotels beginning with R and with five letters and back to back. And he saw Minu's name on the register, went upstairs, knocked on the door. Minu said, how did, you, how did you know I was here? He says, I saw your name on the register. He says, Baba has been bothering us all night long to find you. He wants to see you. In fact, he's in the very next room. Oh. <laughs> and Minu, of course, didn't believe any of this and thought he was kidding. So the Mandali, whoever he was, goes, and Baba from the other side goes. And it was just like a, a tremendous thing for Minu. Well, something very similar happened in my life in the very house where uh, Minu was visiting. And so that story meant an awful lot to me. It was somebody whom I loved whom I was turned away from like that. And yet living with only a wall between us. So anyway, we cut Minu's hair. Minu needed a haircut, so we cut his hair. And uh, <laughs> all the barber shops were closed. No, there was somebody also living in our house from England. I thought you cutting. had another location. <laughs> no, I don't cut hair. <laughs> And uh, just gradually over the years, I knew that I was going to have to come to India. But New York City is like is like a vortex, you know. I could not get out of New York City. It was very difficult. Ten years, I was. Uh, I finally made it to Myrtle Beach under. I mean, it was very difficult for me to even get to Myrtle Beach. I finally made it to Myrtle Beach, and I no sooner got there, and there was a hurricane, and I had to be evacuated. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> time. Yeah. But uh, and just gradually, I've uh, I've come to Baba that way. The reason I came to India was uh, the living situation where I was in in New York. It was fairly near the house on Grove Street, which some of you may be familiar with in Greenwich Village, where Baba gave his first public dasha in 1931. And I'd gone by that house many times, and uh, I always wanted to go in and, and to that house and meet the lady. I knew there was an old lady who lived alone there. 
But I had heard that she had been bothered by lots of Baba lovers over the years and felt that she didn't really want the intrusion. But one day I was walking by there and uh, I saw her putting the key in the door. And I ran up to her and introduced myself to her immediately. And I don't know what I said, that uh, she thought she had known me. And she said, oh, fine, come tomorrow, we'll have tea. And so I went the next day, and she told me about Baba's stay in New York, and uh, let me visit the room. The house hasn't been changed since Baba was in there. It's still as it is as it was in the 30s. And in fact, it's probably the first house where meetings were held in the United States. In 1931, for 25 years in a row, every week, there was a Baba meeting in that house. And uh, I'm... Gradually, I became very close to this woman. She's sort of an invalid, and I would take her to museums and wheel her around in a wheelchair, and she'd take me to concerts in uh, New York Philharmonic. And uh, I was allowed to clean the garden there, which is a garden where Baba walked. And I really felt that was a tremendous privilege. And on Silence Day, she'd let me especially spend a long time in his room. And... Uh, it was like really being with him. I really felt Baba's presence in that house. And I would drive by on my bicycle every day, at least two, three times a day on my daily rounds in New York City, and always go by that house and always look up to the window. So she gave me an invitation. She had an invitation card to that darshan in 1931. And uh, the the space where your name was supposed to be was blank. It was ec evidently an extra one that she had had left over. So she gave that to me. So I'm honoring it now. Chris Rieger. Chris Rieger. Chris Rieger oh, is with the Society. No. <laughs> and I sense here that Bob Rieger did some work on Oh God. I didn't know that until the other day. Did he? Well, then it's pretty obvious because he's a That's what Jeff oh, said, no. Yeah. Jeff said that. One can't help not only feeling strongly, but you know, knowing that this is somebody who's known about Baba. Probably saw a card about a card. What? He looks like somebody's uncle. You mean his guy? <laughs> and he does this and that, and, and this old guy is very much of that. I see. Let's <laughs> No, no, this was here uh, in Pune, the man. I thought so. That was at the end of the play before Bob. Yeah, 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 in 62 or Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Spanish, there was an artist? There is an artist, yeah. Mm. Who has that music? Arsenio. Rodrixa. Rodrigo. Rodrigo. Yeah. Arsenio. He, he's now in Switzerland. The United Nations, some branch of And what other, what other languages besides Indian languages, Spanish and English, Spanish, of course? Spanish, English, American, English. Australian. They are different English. languages, brother. English. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, what do you call, uh, some, some composition is in, in French also. Nothing yet in Italian, is it? Nothing in Italian. Then you begin with it. <laughs> what does that mean, Divya Sanatana Paramatma? Sanatana means ancient one. Divya Sanatana. means uh, effulgent, ancient one. Effulgent. Infinite and radiant the light. Diagana means uh, uh, unlimited compassion. What else? What is there? 
संस्कृत वर्ड फॉर हार्ट एक्सेप्ट दैट विच कम्स आउट ऑफ माई हार्ट डोंट हेजिटेट बी फ्री लेट बी फ्री गिव एंड फ्री टेक <laughs> and so we went round the side around the men's side by the gate over past the small house to Baba's room the door was open and Baba was seated on the bed it was hot that day and he was seated with his sadra down to his waist there were a couple of other people in the room i have no idea who at this point All I saw as we went up to the first step of that room where we stopped was a baba sitting there beaming at me. I was arrested by the wonder of it that he actually was there that all of the reading and the longing and the searching that it had been brought to focus in that one extraordinary moment in which he had graced me with the vision of his presence and all i could do was stare and what i saw and it was only then and with neither before nor since was that i saw his face looking me in the eyes beaming in this great light coming from him a light so extraordinary and so effulgent that it filled the entirety of my vision with his face at the exact center of it beaming and tears poured down my face not so much i think an emotional response but simply physically that the intensity of light brought tears to my eyes by the force of it and i simply looked at it and erich with erich at my side i heard his voice interpreting baba's gestures baba saying that i looked tired and dusty the first thing he said was i am happy to see you and i recall thinking later he's happy to see me <laughs> that i was blessed to be there here that i looked tired and dusty i should have a hot bath should have a good dinner and get a good night's sleep and he would see me in the morning and with that eric turned me around and walked me back over to this side and of course i followed baba's instructions to the letter He also then said that I should read a certain chapter of God speaks before the sun set is that specific and I sat in a chair here in the yard between the two houses between this mandali hall and the small house adjoining and sat in the sun and read that chapter of God speaks on fana and baka You know, I remember that there was exactly enough light in the day no more to allow me to read the last sentence of that last paragraph of that last page and if it had been any longer it would not have been enough light so it was my first knowing example of Baba's perfect timing and I had the hot bath and the good dinner and a somewhat restless sleep 
in the blue bus where he had done the great seclusion and spent so much time. And I should mention that in the blue bus at that time, all that I remember that was in it was a small bed, not the one that's there now. And I was struck that I was asleep in that bed that Baba had himself used, particularly as it was the first night in more than a month that I had slept on any bed. I had slept only on floors, on the wooden hold of the ship, on the cement platforms of the railway station, and that my first bed was his. And I could only be grateful. Early the next morning, Erich woke me. And I washed and we had breakfast together. We then chatted for a while on the veranda with Francis Brabazon and Hindu and others. And Erich said, Well, brother, now it's time for your darshan. We came over here to Mundali Hall and left our shoes outside. And I noticed that Erich was carrying my knapsack. And I wondered at it. And I was shown a place to sit on the floor, about where Jimmy is sitting there, across, so I could be directly across from Baba. And Erich placed my knapsack <coughs> next to me. And I asked him, Why are you bringing in my knapsack, Erich? He said, I just wanted to show Baba how little you brought with you. <laughs> and I assumed it was because. Indians are famous for traveling with great quantities of luggage, and I had a very small bag. And I thought this was the reason. I had not told Erich, nor anyone here, that in that knapsack, I had three doses of pharmaceutical LSD. I had stopped taking other drugs, but LSD I wasn't sure about. And this was before Baba had ever given any public statements about it or any other drugs. I had some fantasy of after the Sahabas program, which would have been over at the end of Christmas, this time of year, that I would then have gone up to Nepal and brought in the New Year colorfully. <laughs> <laughs> but Erich, not knowing, nevertheless placed the knapsack <laughs> next to me. The other Mandali, Min Mandali was sitting here along the walls on both sides. At that time, there were no rugs or cushions. And through this, these doors here, on my left, suddenly I looked over and Baba entered the room, and wearing the white sadra, with his hand resting lightly on Francis Babathon's arm. And as, as soon as I saw him, I stood. And he looked at me down the length of the hall and waved to me to sit down. And it was his habit in those days to walk the length of the hall two or three times for his exercise. For he would sit in the chair and conduct what he referred to as the real news, the business of the work of his lovers in the world. And I noticed, with my eyes fastened on him, that as he passed down the length of this hall, those two or three times, that as he went, I remember that along this wall, the Baidul was sitting in a chair, quite old then, and he had a beard, a gray beard, and the Baba stopped and gave his beard a little tug, and that another one of the old ones, that he stopped and patted his cheek, and there were these little exchanges of love between the beloved and his, his old and somewhat tired of lovers for all the years of service that they'd given him and spent in his company as his constant companions. And then he came and sat in that chair. He didn't have quite as flowerful, flowery a covering at the time. And he motioned to me a gesture that Irish didn't have to interpret, which was this to come to him for his embrace. And I came and stood on the right side of the chair, 
Baba reached his arms up and kissed me on both cheeks, and I kissed him on both cheeks. And he looked me in the eyes and smiled and motioned that I might bow to his feet, which I did. And then doing so, coming from some place, some deeper intuition within me, out of the corner of my eye, with my head on, resting on his feet, I saw the hem of his dharma, the dharma. And I reached up with my left hand and grasped it. In that moment, I had the memory of his saying that we should hold on to his dhamma motivated me, and I thought that this was my opportunity for a brief moment to do it physically, though I knew that it was the least of what holding his dhamma really is. And then he motioned for me to sit down again against the wall and began through Erich to speak to me from the silence. <coughs> he gestured that he was in deep seclusion, that I was blessed to be here. And he looked at me and asked me if I had read God Speaks. I said, no, Baba, that I was reading it, but that I hadn't completed it yet. I had it with me. Baba said that it was good that I was <coughs> reading it, but I should read it again and again until I, quote, felt it singing in my veins, is the way he put it. He then asked me if I'd read Francis Brabazon's book, Staying with God. And I said, no, Baba. And he signaled to Francis and Approximately two minutes later, I had an autographed copy of State of God in my hands. He then said that there were three types of conviction of the existence of God. That the first is intellectual conviction, and that this could be gained through reading God Speaks. That the second was conviction through sight, and that this was the experience of the sixth plane, where one saw him face to face. But still, it was not the real conviction that there was still the feeling of I am thou, of separation, of I seeing. But that the third and highest and only real conviction was union, of knowledge of oneself as the only one. And he said, and how do you get this real conviction, this real knowledge? He said, through surrendering everything at my feet, all your good thoughts and bad, all your actions, all your words, give them all to me and become dust at my feet. He said, I will help you to do this. He then gestured, is there anything you want to know? And without a moment's hesitation, I looked at Baba and said, no, Baba, there's nothing I want to know. And he smiled and said, good, you have had enough of words. It is time now to have the knowledge of the heart. And then he looked again at me and asked, is there anything you want? And again, without a moment's hesitation, I looked at Baba and said, yes, Baba, there is something I want. And he went, what is it? And I said, Baba, I want to see you and everyone and everything always, and to love you as you should be loved, for the sake of others. <coughs> and Baba smiled, and gave a gesture of perfection, and said, if you want this frame, this love that you asked for, it means that you must surrender to me totally. You must become dust at my feet. He said, can you do this? 
He said, I will help you. One day you will see me as I really am. Unfortunately, I didn't ask when. <laughs> Next time. Then I had, a, I had a few weeks' growth of beard. And to break the, the tension, my tension, Baba said, why did I have a beard? And I said, Baba, there I was in Baghdad, and I'd been shaving.